Good morning and welcome to Global Healthcast, brought to you by Global Health Risk. Once a week, we bring to you news and views about vaccines and vaccination. I am Joe Schmidt, and with me, as always, is Dr. Melvin Senecas. Good morning to Switzerland. Good morning, Melvin. Good morning, Professor Schmidt, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to those who are watching us or listening to us today. On our meeting today, we will talk about lowering salt intake, significantly lowered blood pressure in the majority of middle-aged to elderly adults. We give you some data on human papillomavirus HPV strain replacement. We talk about the chikungunya vaccine to be approved in the United States. Then I will cover a new mutation, BA286, on the coronavirus. We speak about a diphtheria outbreak in Nigeria and about the ineffectiveness of an anti-pseudomegalovirus hyper-IgG preparation. Melvin, you have the first topic. It is about salt, interestingly. What's so interesting about dietary sodium and blood pressure? Yes, so I, this is a study that just came out recently. Um, and I think this is quite important because hypertension is a major global public health problem. And it, when, when it comes to dealing with risk factors for high blood pressure, focusing on three aspects of nutrition and lifestyle can really get us on the right track, right? And one is really reducing the salt intake because sodium or salt encourages our body to retain fluid, which can increase the fluid volume of our blood and raise the blood pressure. So in this study, it, it really shows that it is quite significant actually. Um, the findings of this study showed that um, dietary, dietary sodium restriction um, or significantly reducing your um, sodium lowers your BP in, in majority of middle age to elderly adults. So I think this is really good. And the, the study also showed that the decline in BP uh, from a high to low sodium diet was independent of hypertension status and hypertensive, anti-hypertensive medication use. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I guess high blood pressure is something very, very frequent out in populations there. And honestly, I'm taking blood pressure medication. I think I have a low salt diet to begin with, but maybe I take the opportunity to check again. Uh, yeah. Very important to remind. Yeah. yeah, very important to remind everybody. Uh, it is a little bit difficult. I'm I'm not knowledgeable in nutrition. Uh, but um, if you use um, herbs to uh, make your food more tasty, do these herbs or what other ingredients have any salt or is this salt free? I think it's important to check the labels, right? So I, okay. for me, I always do that. But if you just compare, I would say the herb that you buy and maybe real pure salt, of course, it's, it's easy to say that the salt that you buy from, from the grocery store, that you should stop using that, right? And, and use other alternatives. Thank you very much for this information. And uh, you have another topic, which is HPV strain replacement. And this follows many, many articles showing and uh, documenting the huge success uh, with HPV vaccines to reduce uh, genital cancers. So what is the story here? Yeah, so this one is a new study in cell, host, and microbe, um, but this one is showing the human papilloma virus HPV strains, which are unlikely to cause cancer. So uh, the non-cancer causing strains, right? They are evolving to replace the strains targeted by the current vaccines. And the study also showed that vaccinating both boys and girls with current vaccines are actually good to elicit herd immunity. And the study was based on HPV strains seen in 33 towns in Finland, randomized to either vaccinate boys uh, and girls, um, vaccinate girls only, or offer no vaccination at all. And the study tracked outcomes among more than 60,000 participants, um, all born between 1992 and 1994. And they were tested for HPV at different ages, at age 18, 22 and four and eight years after vaccination. And so I think it's really um, a good study to show us that um, HPV strain is, the HPV strains are replaced according to what is being used in, in the vaccine. And I think professor, you've seen this as well in uh, PCV, right? Yeah, 
In, in PCV, some types take over. You may call it a replacement. You may call it, it happens anyway. It's always difficult to, uh, uh, to look at it from a teleological point of view. You, you cannot say uh, A follows B. It doesn't mean that A causes B, but in any event, it's good news. If I understand this right, and if I may repeat what you said is, the cancer strains are replaced by HPV strains that do not cause cancer, correct? Well, yes, because um, the vaccines um, that we have at the moment, they have the 16 and 18, right? Which are the cancer right. strains, the major ones. Yeah, very good news then. Uh, this is, uh, uh, again, along the line of uh, using vaccines. And, you, you know, in many countries, it was much debated if an HPV vaccine should be used. And now we're getting more and more information on how effective they are to reduce genital cancers. And replacement in this situation is a good news. This is really nice. Melvin, you have another topic which is a rare disease in Europe right now, but once you have it, it's devastating. And this is chikungunya. Yes, um, so I think this is good news uh, for public health because the US FDA recently announced that it has approved Valneva's chikungunya vaccine. It's the first vaccine of its kind against mosquito-borne diseases. Um, the vaccine is called Ixchik, and it is approved for those uh, who are 18 and above at increased risk for disease. Um, chikungunya is considered an emerging global health threat with at least 5 million cases reported over the last 15 years, um, mainly in areas where the mosquito that carries the virus is endemic. And the most effective regions include Africa, Southeast Asia, and parts of, of the Americas. And um, it's also important to know that chikungunya is spreading to new areas, which has led to a rise in global prevalence. And this is mainly because of the changing climate, right? And um, we've discussed this with other disease with other mosquito-borne diseases in the past, that because mosquitoes now can live in more places, um, as opposed to maybe 10, 20 years ago, we see mosquitoes in more places and we expect diseases caused by mosquito in more, more places as well, right? Um, so this disease isn't usually fatal, but it is known to cause fever and sometimes debilitating joint pain that can last for months to years and other symptoms include rash, headache, muscle pain, and transmission to babies from mothers during pregnancy can cause potentially fatal infections. So I think this is good news that we have now this live attenuated vaccine given as a single dose, uh, which can uh, protect against chikungunya disease. And maybe we should have a Global Health Cast special on the topic. I think this is really good news. And uh, um, uh, we need to add it to our vaccinology course and we need to add it uh, in our global health cast. Maybe stay tuned, we will have more on chikungunya. Thanks for finding this, Melvin. This is really good. I have now one topic on a new SARS-CoV-2 variant. Actually, as of late July this year, it became uh, evident in some surveillance program that there's a new highly mutated Omicron subvariant, BA286, and that you see up here. And you see all the mutations in the different uh, parts. These are the parts of the virus, of the genomic parts of the virus. And you see this variant has a lot of mutations here uh, that is uh, in the receptor binding domain. And the mutations that you see in the BA286 only are down here in blue. And uh, this is a large number already, which are unique to this subvariant. Whereas the other variants that emerged over the last months and years, they have uh, mutations, they share very many common mutations, but the B eight six uh, uh, mutations are in this dark blue color down here. Now, why is this important? Number one, these mutations result in spreading of the virus which is 1.29 times greater than that of XBB15 that we covered before. And that is actually what is in the vaccine uh, that we give for this season. Now, if you look, if people were infected with XBB15, they, their sera, their antibodies 
do not really well neutralize the BA286 variant compared to other variants, right? So the neutralizing titers are lower. And if you were infected with BA4 or BA5, it is again lower. And if you were infected with uh, with this strain, it is lower again for the 28 for the 286 strain. So uh, stay tuned, uh, and it looks as if BA 2.86 will be a uh, variant that will need to be dealt with in the near future. Melvin, you are the COVID expert. So you are an author of this great book on COVID. Any input, any ideas from your side? Yeah, so Professor, I think one thing that we should really um, um, take into consideration is that um, although we have all these great studies on mutations of SARS-CoV-2, um, basically majority of the world now has been vaccinated or infected or both. And I think that this really has changed the, the landscape, right? And, and that's the reason why even with all these mutations, we don't see um, outbreaks like we have seen in 2020. So I, I think it's good to still really uh, monitor these mutations and uh, variants, but I, I think we should also see whether they are really, um, let's say, affecting us uh, in terms of maybe increased hospitalizations or, or maybe increase severity of disease? Right now, there is no indication that it does. It just will be dominant, right? And, and, the and, and this we have seen in previous variants that have been described as yeah. like this, right? Remember those other yeah. variants we've covered in the past? So I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's going to be the same. Yeah, actually, uh, this is nicely covered in our vaccinology course in the chapter on microbiology, chapter one, written by uh, Professor Solbach from Lübeck. And what he nicely describes is what is called balanced immunity. You, the host and the virus, they uh, deal with each other by balancing immunity and pathogenicity. And in the end, you have, uh, you may have highly reproductive viruses, but they don't cause much of disease. And this is, again, uh, as Melvin pointed out, this is what we expect to see. Melvin, do I get you right here? Yes, correct. Okay, very good. Next topic is on a very beautiful country, highly populated. It is Nigeria, here in the heart of Africa. Uh, they have 200 million people living in Nigeria. Now, the Bad news is they have a diphtheria outbreak, and uh, so far they have 13,000 suspected cases, and they have 8,576 confirmed cases in 116 local government areas, 19 of their states, and federal capital territory. The epicenter is Kano, and they have about 85% of the cases. Most cases, a uh, three quarter of all cases roughly, are children. Be to, uh, up to 14 years of age. So far, they have 600 deaths. I think this approaches 1%, right? 8,500 8, confirmed cases, mm -hmm. 600 deaths. This is almost 1%. Oh, yes. yeah, this almost is a lot. Yeah. yeah. Prime mm -hmm. malaria and children. So children suffer most. Why do they see this? They have population growth. They have climate-related declines in hygiene, and this is due to water shortages. But the main driver is a gap in vaccine uptake. This is a deja vu. The deja vu is the outbreak in Russian-speaking countries. And again, that is just a few decades ago that this happened, and it was the same problem. Vaccine uptake was low. Diphtheria is probably very hard, if not impossible, to eliminate. So if you start vaccinating almost immediately, but very soon later, you will see cases. And just to be complete, of the confirmed cases, 64% were unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, 24 were fully vaccinated. Now, this is again, this doesn't speak against vaccination. What, what it only tells you is that there is already a high number of people who were vaccinated, but the infectious disease pressure is very high. If you are exposed to one 
coronabacterium diphtheria. You won't come down with diphtheria if you're vaccinated. But if you get infected with billions of this uh, pathogen, then the likelihood of getting infected is much higher because your immunity is overwhelmed. Again, 8.9% uh, unknown vaccination status. So again, the main message is here, this is an outbreak due to under vaccination or non vaccination. Any insights from your point? Any comments, uh, Melvin? Yeah, I, I think it's just sad, Professor, that this happens uh, over and over again. Um, we, in, in different countries, different cities, we, we always see this and then we, we learn that the vaccination uptake should be increased because we, we need herd immunity, but then people forget again, believe in fake news, believe in misinformation or whatever other reason just for them to not get the vaccine. And then this happens again. And we have seen yeah. this as well in communities in, in, in the US. Um, and I think it's just sad that uh, this is just happening over and over again and uh, children are dying. Yeah, 1% is really something. Look, if, if, if the 600 deaths are largely in children, then it really is approaching 1%, right? 1% of children with a disease will die. And that mm -hmm. is like uh, before World War II, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In any event, I have one more piece, and I'm so sorry. It is, again, not too good news. <clears throat> the news is, in the past, uh, we always were looking for, uh, as a pediatrician, I'm a pediatrician, we were looking for congenital pseudomegalovirus. And we know that depending on the country, 0.2 to 2% of children are born with congenital pseudomegalovirus, and the main symptom is he deafness. They cannot hear. There are other um, there are other symptoms as well, but the main is really deafness. Now, in the past, a study was done uh, to identify women who had a primary pseudomegalovirus infection during pregnancy, and these women received monthly infusions of a hyperimmunoglobulin or placebo until delivery. So this is a study from the past. And what happened is there was no benefit of the hyperimmunoglobulin on the incidence of congenital pseudomegalovirus of the fetal or neonatal death. So having, having had this intervention available at the time of the infection, the immunoglobulin came too late. Now, the question is, what is the outcome in the children of treated or untreated mothers? So there was a two-year follow-up study, and this is what is new. This is the current publication. The, the, the hyperimmunoglobulin did not prevent the infection of the mothers and of the child at birth. Did it have any impact on the severity of disease in children? Here they enrolled 360 children, 90% of the initial cohort. They had um, uh, death or CMD infection with severe disability in 13% in the hyperimmunoglobulin group and in 10% in the placebo group. You see already no effect, right? There, there is nothing, that the, the, no benefit from the vaccine here. But also, there was no relevant difference between the incidence of any component or of the composite outcome or in any other outcome at 24 months, including severe disability with or without congenital CMD infection. Again, no effect of the uh, hyperimmunoglobulin. And the limitations of the study is certainly they had quite low event rates and missing data. But looking at the data so far, you have... Uh, 20 and uh, you have 30, 20 and 15 uh, children uh, in the virum and in the placebo group uh, with uh, severe disability or death. There is no indication that high immunoglobulin could work. What it tells you is the high immunoglobulin comes too late. So the goal must be to prevent primary pseudomegalovirus infection during pregnancy. What we need is very similar to rubella. We need a vaccine against pseudomegalovirus that can be given to all women with, of childbearing age or probably in adolescence, and maybe even similar to rubella to all boys in, in a very similar way to induce herd protection. 
So this is uh, the conclusion of this study. And it is so sad to see that there is a negative outcome, but it was worth doing because we have been discussing such a study over decades. And now we know, I think there is no benefit of a hyperimmunoglobulin now and in the future. And what we do need is active immunization of adolescent girls or whoever, girls and boys, uh, earlier in lifetime before pregnancy occurs. Melvin, any views from your side? No, Professor, I think it's quite clear. Um, it's it's not working and we need other tools and other ways to, to deal with this. Yeah. All right, this summarizes what we talked about today. We talked about lowering salt intake to reduce your blood pressure. We said that HPV vaccination causes strain replacement, and this time this is good news because the cancer types disappeared. The good news was chikungunya vaccine available in the United States, very nice, against a very severe disease. I spoke about the new SARS-BA286 mutation, the diphtheria outbreak in Nigeria with a 1% mortality rate, and we covered that anti-CMV hyper IgG does not prevent CMV diseases in infants. Now, Melvin, you have a last point, and this is on this slide. Yes, uh, I think this is just a photo that I wanted to share to people to, to remind everyone that overnight success is actually not true because it involves many things like hard work, sacrifice, late nights of working, tough decisions, disappointments, and so on and so forth. So just uh, reminding people that if you want to be successful, you have to be ready to um, work hard and sacrifice for it. Yeah. So coming to world life, work life balance, uh, if you want to be very successful, uh, there is nothing around hard work, right? Uh, there is no yeah. hard, uh, there's no substitute for hard work in the end. Apparently very not. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much for listening. This was our Global Healthcast 52. I am Joe Schmidt and I say goodbye to you until next week. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Get your flu vaccines if you haven't yet. <laughs>